Welcome. This podcast is a collaboration of Religka and URI, United Religions Initiative. Since 2016, Sarah Oliver has been the URI Youth Coordinator for the Southern African region. In this role, she led interfaith and leadership skills training programs with youth from cooperation circles across South Africa, Malawi, and Mozambique. She also developed the Girls Not Brides campaign with URI Youth Ambassadors in these areas. Starting in July 2019, Sarah is the URI Global Youth Coordinator, expanding her work to connect, support, and inspire youth engagement globally in URI's network. Take a listen. Well, for me as a, as a peace builder and as an interfaith activist, I think one thing that is very important to me is the value of inner, inner peace. I think when we are working out in the field as interfaith peace builders, it's very easy to get carried away with all the chaos and activities and things that are, that are going wrong in the world. But I really strongly believe that our outer actions are a reflection of our inner state. And so the practice of, of mindfulness and contemplation and self-reflection are all really important things that I think build and strengthen our work as peace builders. And so that would be one important value. Another one would be listening. I think listening is crucial to the work that we're doing. I think if, and listening with, with compassion, listening with empathy, listening with humility, to really kind of bear witness to another person's story. And in my context, I work a lot with young people and I bring young people together from different religions, faiths, backgrounds, traditions, all sorts of things. In a South African context, which is where I'm from, what that looks like is, yeah, different, particularly different people of different races because of our history and different socioeconomic classes and bringing people together in a space of dialogue where listening is at the heart of, of that process and you're really bearing witness to another person's experience. And we have amazing moments where, you know, I, I think of a, of a particular moment comes to mind of two 16 year old boys, one was Muslim um, and the other was Christian. And they were doing a process called intentional listening, where they were having a conversation about the values that they get from their different faiths and their different traditions and the challenges that they face being teenage boys, peer pressure of, you know, alcohol and partying when their religions say something different. And even though they were coming from different religions, they were able to kind of, there was a shared experience and a shared commonality in terms of that struggle that is sometimes experienced as a as a young person. And through a process of listening, they really heard each other and, and you know, there was a mutual bond that was formed. You brought up like in the, in the South African context that mm-hmm. it's not only religious, um, mm-hmm. but racial and socioeconomic um, and cultural differences that we all face and, and, and that cause tension and conflict. Mm-hmm. One of the things that you are was focusing on specifically in this conference was the idea of eliminating and relieving religiously motivated violence. Do you think that it's enough just to work on that or there's systemic issues kind of like you talked of that must be addressed in order to kind of create the kind of peaceful world that we're striving for? And what does that look like in terms of integrating with the peace building work on the religious side? Yeah, I think you I think you can't do peace without social justice work and I think they yeah, I think they go hand in hand and have to have to go alongside together. I think violence takes many different forms. In a South African context, we're, we're lucky to live in a relatively peaceful society in the sense of um, you like religious violence. I mean, we have, we, we're, it's a very tolerant, religious kind of tolerant space, but the violence is still prevalent in terms of the kind of economic injustice, particularly that exists, and the, the kind of prejudice and stereotypes between societies and communities you know, certain groups still see other groups as a as the enemy, even though that might not be physically uh, shown. And and so those those kind of psychological violences and hidden violences still very much exist and and play out in in the kind of systemic oppression that I think globally we're realizing is, you know, a huge problem that needs to be addressed. And so if the interfaith peace building world can contribute to 
the the world of social justice and and systemic change um i really think we can and i think we can be leaders of that movement because we have such strong values to draw on in terms of all our different religions that can really make an impact in in contributing to creating a more socially just and and peaceful world what are the values thing that kind of like undergird that you've seen in young people like this leadership potential to be strong peace builders there's an incredible resilience i think and just a, a complete determination to not take no for an answer <laughs> and i think that's yeah that's in, that's incredibly powerful as a as a student myself i've been involved with the the student movements that have happened at the university of cape town and uh, around particularly around transformation and decolonization and in in those spaces i just you know i'm struck by the yeah the passion and the power and the 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 strength that is in the voices of young people and the the kind of collective sense of a a collective consciousness of like we're learning and doing things together and we're having fun together in the process <laughs> and yeah a real kind of joyfulness and i think that's what young people bring you know combined with that resilience to really say what needs to be said and you know stand up for what we believe in those are just some of the things that yeah continue to inspire me can we build peace without empowering our young generations to be leaders mm-hmm. i think we the vision is to, by creating a peaceful world or a world of peace that would be a world where where young people feel empowered in you know inherently just because of of the nature of the space and and the fact that the world we're, we're trying to create is one where everybody is is respected and is heard and also where young people can or where everyone can be the fullest expression of themselves i think that's another thing that particularly young people are, are calling for and you know in the sense of challenging all stereotypes and ideas and versions of like who i'm meant to be in the world pushing those boundaries completely it's a beautiful cry for let me be who i am and be fully who i am and that's my vision of what a peaceful world would be you know where we can all be the fullest expressions of ourselves and our most authentic selves in every way possible one And I don't know if you get asked this a lot in Cape Town, South Africa, about the water crisis. Yes. Because other places are facing it. We know that you've already um, mm-hmm. have been dealing with that. Has that been like an interfaith conversation as well? It has. I think it's it's been so. It was a year ago now that Cape Town went through the really difficult drought period, where you know the mayor announced that day zero was going to happen and they were going to turn off all the taps and people were um going to need to be queuing for water and it was, so it was a complete crisis in that way and what was really great i thought about it was that for once everybody was on a kind of equal playing field right so you had the wealthy and the not so wealthy all in the same boat because we all depend on water so it's a it's a beautiful unifier in that way the experience of how we interact and and use water what then kind of started to happen was that that communities and the, and the religious and interfaith communities were a part of this started you know mobilizing and reaching out to each other making sure that elderly people in their community would have access to water would be able to you know get to the water points have other people bring the the buckets that we were all you know made to use and other other systems there was a lot of concern around safety and ma- and making sure that a kind of monitoring the process of people collecting water because obviously you know that there's a possibility there for for violence and so the religious community and interfaith communities were were called to be a part of that process luckily day zero didn't actually happen <laughs> um and that was due to the fact that so many people really took seriously the water saving measures and made big changes to the way that they were living their lives and i think it just shows what is possible if we all put our minds to it and all actually do it and it, it it was it was you really had to change the way that you were living instead of having like a 5 minute shower every morning you had a 1 minute shower and it's i mean it just it's for so many highlighted the like the privileged way that um we were living our lives because again in in Cape Town just to give a kind of context of the disparities 
we have a very large, I think it's a million people living in informal settlements in the border Cape Town area, the majority of which don't have access to water on a daily basis. So there was this kind of incredible paradox because suddenly you've got wealthy people living in you know, rich houses with running water who are in a complete panic because they've never known how to live without water. Whereas just a couple of you know, miles away, you have people in the same city who are very used to living without water. And so there was a really rich kind of social justice conversation that we were able to have as a society around the value of water, who has it, who doesn't, which was a really, really important and needed conversation to have. And like I said, it showed how people can change their behavior. Um, you know, we're not stuck in, in our ruts and our ways of, yeah, kind of doing things in all, all the same way. It is possible to change our behavior and we can really come together and mobilize around these important issues. That's really, it's inspiring to know and help, like hopeful mm. to know that people cooperated in such a way. And have you seen those changes kind of last as like the urgency of day zero got a little bit farther away? <laughs> it's... I think it, it's it's died down a little bit in the last year. It isn't the top news story anymore. My hope is that most people have kept the practices, you know, that they ch the changes that they made into the, the way that they've lived their lives to continue saving water. But again, in 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 Cape Town, there's so many issues on our doorsteps, kind of all the time that. It, yeah, it becomes a competition, right? I mean, we just had our elections, and so that was kind of took over the news, right. <laughs> um, as it were. But it's the there are a lot of a lot of school groups and a lot of organisations as well that are doing a lot around environmental and water um, conservation. So it's definitely continuing, like it hasn't stopped. <laughs> I think about that a lot in terms of, especially the environment work, and it makes me wonder if. If we have to reach a crisis point in order to like significantly change our behavior, yeah, like we shouldn't have to, but people seem to be so fast asleep that it gets to that point, right? <laughs> like where it's like, oh, now we have to do something. But again, you know, one can just hope that the the small kind of steps of action make enough noise to to really call people to change before we get to the crisis point. I think in terms of climate action. We're definitely already in the clim the crisis point, maybe even beyond. We just had a before I left to to come to come here. We had the first schools walk out march around climate change, which has been happening around the world, and we we did that in in Cape Town with, and and there was a beautiful just diversity of young people there as part of the protest, and I think that was another indicator of these things are common to us, you know, no matter where we come from and what our different backgrounds are we all need a world and a planet to live in and so it was really encouraging to see young people taking a stand for that. I think like the last question I guess is what is one question that seems like essential in order to move forward into a world that we mm. want to live in? So I'm reading Adrienne Marie Brown's book at the moment called Emergent Strategy and the question that she asks in that book which has just yeah, really landed for me is is what are the the ways of being that are going to liberate all of us, and and it's this idea of liberation that I don't think we've achieved as a world yet. Liberation in in all forms, and you know, going back to the things we've spoken about, being the fullest expression of ourselves, being able to really break down the systems of oppression that continue to exist, whether it be race, class, gender, all of that this idea that, that there has to be a new way of living and that new way of living, yeah, my question is just like, how can we creatively and consciously put effort into imagining and then living out that new way of being? If you would like to know more about United Religions Initiative, read stories of interfaith in action, visit www.uri.org. And to learn more about Religica and our allies, take a look at www.religica.org. Thanks.